Hello and welcome to Theology Unleashed, the channel where Eastern theology meets Western skepticism. I'm Arjuna and today I'm hosting a debate between Matt Dillahunty and Zach Sickler. So not Eastern theology today. Um, Zach is a Christian and um, many of you will know who Matt is. He's an atheist and well known for his debating skills and logic. And Zach is a Christian. He runs a small YouTube channel where he hosts discussions on philosophy of religion and related topics. And um, rather than the usual introductions, I thought I'd ask our guests what they hope to achieve for the audience in today's discussion or get out of the discussion themselves. Uh, so Matt, would you like to go first? Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me here. It's uh, I, I don't know Zach and, and uh, I apologize between all the other things going on. I haven't actually seen his channel, but I'll check something out later. I, I just like having the discussions and quite often, there's a lot of people who will do the generic does God exist instead of defending what they actually believe and nobody ever suggested that they would defend the notion that a perfect mind is responsible for creating the universe and I want to find out if I missed something and if other debate opponents that I've I've been with have uh, missed something as well so I'm looking forward to it cool thanks for that and Zach yeah I just look forward thanks first thanks for having me um, just to like talking with Matt and trying to understand what he believes more and seeing like where we agree, where we disagree. Um, and yeah, just trying to look at some questions and dive into it. And I just hope for everyone listening that you just find something edifying from this. And I know you're not all going to come down to my side of the fence or Matt's. Um, but yeah, just take something away from this and hopefully it serves your time well. Cool. So the format today, we're doing maximum 10 minute openings and then we'll have uh, open discussion. And then we're going to save 20 minutes at the end for discussion. And we're going to try to keep it all down to a 90 minute video. So Zach, take the floor. Alrighty. Can you see my slides and everything like that? Oh, uh, give me a second to set that up actually. Do you want to get started while I set that up? It'll probably take a minute. Sure. Yeah. Um, first I'll just say like, thanks to Matt, uh, to agreeing to do this. One of the things I really value about Matt is it seems like he's super, um, just willing to talk to anyone about anything. Um, and it seems like, you know, some people, maybe if they have a big platform like Matt, they'll be like, oh, you have to have like 100,000 followers or whatever to have a conversation with me. Um, so I value Matt a lot. And I really hope that um, this serves his time well and serves everyone else's listening time well. So, yeah, I'm a Christian. I'm a theist. I believe God exists. Specifically, I'm going to say that a perfect mind created the universe. And yeah, this will be my opening presentation. And I will wait until the slides are ready from here because I would love for people to um, just kind of read. What we're getting at to get the specific definition um so when you're ready i'll just dive right into it so yeah super excited uh should I come up let me try oh there we go okay yeah your slides there well so what do i mean by god um i'm going to say the conceptions of maximal greatness differ but theists believe that a maximally great reality must be a maximally great person or god these largely agree that a maximally great person would be omnipresent omnipotent omniscient and all good that's from the stanford encyclopedia encyclopedia of philosophy on concepts of god the definition that i want to defend is that a perfect mind is a perfect mind that created the universe and by mind i'm going to think something like a sort of like a source of like consciousness so my case for god's existence i don't have some like knockdown proof where i'm like here's my three premises boom god exists matt like what are you thinking here um that's not how i'm doing this at all so my case for god is is like this and i'm using theism to refer to, to my specific hypothesis of the perfect mind creating the universe um, first, I'm going to say that theism is simpler than atheism as it makes less foundational commitments. And the second thing I'm going to say is that theism has more explanatory power than atheism. The world looks more like what we'd expect if God exists than if God does not exist. And I understand that like not all atheists are going to say that God does not exist. Um, so when I'm saying atheism here in this presentation, I'm specifically referring to the claim that God does not exist. I know that many people may disagree with this definition. I'm not here to debate the definition of atheism. So if you have a different different definition, that's fine with me. I'm just trying to keep this as simple as possible. Um, so yeah, for my atheism, just for my opening statement, I mean the position that God does not exist. Okay, so part one of my case is just that theism is simpler than atheism. So here's what I think. Theism makes one commitment regarding the nature of the foundation. It's perfect. Um, from perfection, I think we could follow that like traditional divine attributes like power and knowledge and goodness can follow from it. Um, so yeah. I think that theism is going to be simpler because it makes one commitment, whereas many versions of atheism, and remember, atheism in the idea that like God does not exist, um, I understand there's different views on the definition, but that's just what I'm doing here. Um, a view where reality is fundamentally indifferent, pose 
um, something that's mind independent, whereas theism can explain all the same data about the world um, solely with mind, I think, which is what we know exists, I think, foundationally. So a perfect being is also going to lack arbitrary limits and brute geometric commitments that an atheistic foundation probably has to add on. So Josh Rasmussen has a great quote about this where he says that all limits alike have an outside explanation upon which they depend. Yet the basic features of the foundation, by contrast, lack an outside explanation. Therefore, the basic features of the foundation have no limits. So what I'm thinking about here is thinking about like two different ideas. One is that like God exists and a perfect mind creates the universe. Um, and I think in that theory, we really have like one thing that's kind of fundamental that we might have to assert that's like brute. And you can say maybe two, something that's perfect. And you could say like, I really, I'm fine saying like a perfect mind. Whereas if like reality isn't like that, uh, it's something indifferent, you're probably gonna have to pose brute limits. So, like for example, let's say the foundation is like 10,294 fundamental units of matter energy. And the question becomes like, why are there 10,294 rather than 10,295 or 10,293? Why are the particles the size they are, the weight they are, and so on? It seems like on an indifferent picture of the foundation of the universe, you have to add a bunch of things into your um, hypothesis of the foundation um, that are not given. So you're just like adding on brute facts. So long story short, I think theism po posits less brute facts than atheism. Trent Dougherty has a really great quote in the Blackwell Companions to the Problem of Evil. I'm not going to read the whole thing here, but here's what he says. Counting up, I'm skipping to the green, that big green section at the bottom. Counting up the number of brute facts in naturalism by the same method used earlier will be difficult, but it seems that inevitably it postulates more than one brute fact existent with only two properties held in the simplest ways. So, that would say that like God is fundamentally like zero limitation and full of like knowledge and power, and that's it, and that's worth positing. Whereas under like atheism or naturalism, you're gonna have to posit a bunch more at your foundation if you have like a fleshed out theory of everything. Okay, so. That's part one where I want to say that theism is simpler than atheism. Now, part two is where I want to say that theism has more explanatory power than atheism. So here's what that means. There's many phenomena in the world that are more likely to exist if there is a God rather than if there is not a God. So again, going back to this, I'm not trying to have some knockdown proof where I'm going to say consciousness exists, therefore God, atheism can't explain consciousness. I have no interest in that kind of argument because I just don't think it's super fruitful and doesn't lead to a lot of good debate. What I'm asking you to do is think. Okay, so like take a step back and think. Let's say like God exists and there's a perfect mind that creates the universe. What would we expect the universe to look like if that's the case? And then I want you to think like, what if like God doesn't exist and there is no perfect mind that created the universe? What would the world look like if that's not the case? So what I would say is that there's a bunch of different facts that are more expected on that theism side of things where there is a God than on that atheism side of things where there is no God. So I'm going to say things like the existence of embodied conscious moral agents is more likely if God exists than if God does not exist. Not saying that it can exist under atheism. If you have like a, you could explain consciousness through like the brain states, fine. Like that's totally compatible with my argument. So if Matt wants to bring up brain states, then cool. I don't really have anything I'm going to push back on, I think, uh, in terms of that respect. I'm just saying that the existence of these conscious moral agents like you and me and Matt, um, who can make decisions and have debates and like, come to moral judgments and just do all kinds of amazing things, is more expected if God exists than if God does not exist. Because surely our existence is a good thing. If it wasn't a good thing, why don't we just like wipe out humanity right now? Like, I think we all agree it's a terrible idea and we shouldn't do it. And it's because human beings are good. Our existence is good. We may cause suffering and all kinds of bad things, but all things else, our existence is good. I also think the existence of accurate moral knowledge is more expected on theism than atheism. How can we come con to conclusions like murder is wrong or like torturing babies for fun is wrong? It seems like on theism, it's more likely we would have this accurate moral knowledge is say, if God exists. You might want our moral knowledge to be directed towards like the good to come towards truth. Whereas like under like an atheistic view where our moral knowledge is a product of our evolutionary history, it seems more likely to me that it's possible that maybe we come to other beliefs that would have like survival advantages. Maybe killing babies would be good for like a survival advantage in some possible world under atheism. Not all possible worlds. I'm not saying that, but under maybe like some. In that case, maybe our moral knowledge would incline us to say that like that's good. But surely like you get repulsive if you think that that's actually there's a possible world where that's okay. So I also think the existence of a good and beautiful world um, is evidence for theism. I'm not saying look at the trees, therefore God exists. Um, no interest there again in that. But just saying that like a beautiful world, a world where we have like beautiful things like sunrises is more likely on the existence of God is that a, as a hypothesis than like God not existing. Also the existence of free agents, um, widespread theistic belief where it looks like most people across time have seemed to believe in something um, like my definition. Definitely not everyone. Definitely, you know, not a lot, not everyone's a monotheist, um, things like that, but widespread belief in some sort of theism where there is some sort of God or gods 
seems to be pretty widespread. We can look at the data of like cosmic fine tuning um, and say that theism also better explains our sense of meaning and purpose. So long story short, there's a bunch of things that are more likely to exist if there is a God rather than if there is not a God. Okay, so again, I'm not claiming that atheism cannot explain these facts. I'm just saying that these phenomena are more likely to exist if God exists than if God does not exist. We could say the probability, probability of some fact on theism is high, uh, whereas the probability of some fact on atheism is low. So, therefore, the probability of, cer of certain fact on theism is going to outweigh that fact on atheism. So, all things being equal, some sort of thing, like insert, like embodied conscious moral agents or fine tuning or more knowledge, is going to be evidence that favors theism over atheism. These aren't conclusive proofs, but just evidence, like evidential chips in favor of theism. Okay, so part three, putting the threads together. Okay, so in sum, what I'm doing is like I'm trying to compare theories here. Um, if a theory is simpler and has more explanatory power, it should be preferred over its rivals. So I, the first part, I argue that theism is simpler than atheism. I think that simplicity matters because the more complex your hypothesis is, the more ways it could be false. For example, compare theism with the idea of the whole universe being necessary. I think that if we posit, say, maybe like a perfect mind to create a universe, I have maybe in my brute facts, a perfect mind, one, and it creates the universe, two. And if you want to distinct perfect in mind, maybe we got three. We're under, whereas under a hypothesis that maybe like the universe is necessary, you have to say like maybe like the quantum field that created the universe is absolutely necessary or like matter energy and all of its units are necessary and there's like 10 to the 82nd and not one more or one less things like that and you're gonna add a bunch more commitments on that atheistic hypothesis than that theistic hypothesis also i think explanatory power that second part matters because it shows which hypothesis best explains the data we experience this is why we've shifted to things like thinking the earth isn't six thousand years old because there's a bunch of evidence that's better explained by an earth that's a lot older than that other hypothesis that it's like 6,000 years old. So given the simplicity of theism along with its explanatory power, I think it should be preferred unless another theory can come to rival it. Um, and long story short, I think the existence of God maximizes explanation while minimizing commitments. So that's all I have. Thanks. You're on mute, just so you know. Sorry. Yeah, so that was uh, right on 10 minutes or just under. So now it's Matt time, Matt's time to respond. So take it away. All right. Let me start a timer here so I can get uh, visibly here. Um, All right, so the easiest way for me to start is to tell you what goes through my head when a debates topic is presented. And the first step should be to define terms. As Zach is the one defending the proposition, he's going to need to define those terms, and he's done that to some extent. That said, until there were definitions, I just had to go with whatever my understanding was. So does God exist is a common topic, and the person defending uh, could have one of many different gods in mind. If someone wasn't, doesn't want to defend a specific theological topic, they'll often propose topics that are more vague. It's rare that we get someone who proposes a topic that is more specific than the bare minimum. And that's what kind of what I happened here that I was intrigued by this notion that the debate wasn't, is the universe a creation? Isn't it wasn't, is the universe probably a creation? It wasn't, is it an intentional creation of an existing uh -huh. agent? It was of a perfect mind. And so I had to sit here and think about what do we mean by a perfect mind? Well, we're not talking about something like perfect numbers because that's a mathematical usage um, that's very narrow. It's basically when you talk about perfect numbers, that's just something that we applied to it. It's almost a hyperbole of this is the cool concept and we're going to call these perfect. We're also not talking about something like a perfect circle, though that may be closer because a perfect circle is merely like an abstract concept that can't exist in actuality. But I've, I, I, there's people out there who are like, I've seen people draw a perfect circle. No, you haven't. Well, I've seen one printed out. No, you haven't. At the finest re resolution, you're, there's, there's no perfect circle. It can't exist. As soon as there's a line weight or a thickness that would be visible, it's no longer uh, the circle by definition, and there's no way to get to that resolution. We misuse the word perfect regularly. And even here, I had to wonder, is this just hyperbole? Because I think we'd agree that none of us have a perfect mind. I don't have a perfect mind. I don't know anybody else who does. And, and so how do we know that a perfect mind is even possible? I have no idea. I don't know how one could demonstrate that a perfect mind is possible. I don't even know how one could really demonstrate what a perfect mind is. Um, how could we identify a perfect mind? How could we identify what is the product of a perfect mind, whether something is created by an imperfect mind or a nearly perfect mind or an almost perfect mind or just one perfect measurement short of a perfect mind or an imperfect mind? These are all important questions for this debate because we need a mechanism to identify this. 
And so what's the mechanism? There's a temptation to say, I can do things at my maximum level, or I could do things beneath my capacity. A, a pool hustler comes to mind. I could play at my max skill level, or I could play at a lower skill level. And because of that, we assume that a perfect mind could create imperfection. But that is a flawed assumption that I'm not convinced is, is the case. I'm able to play beneath my level because I have the ability to be imperfect. Does a perfect being have the ability to be imperfect as well? Does the perfect being have the ability to create something that isn't perfect? That's not clear. And I need some evidence and a mechanism and a way to demonstrate that, hey, not only is this a creation, but it's an imperfect creation created by a perfect mind. And so Zach is in the unfortunate position of needing to demonstrate that a perfect mind is possible, that the product of a perfect mind is identifiable, that the universe is the sort of imperfection that a perfect mind could create if it could. And what, and then finally, that this is in fact what happened. I'm interested to hear the mechanism, the evidence that support any of those. After all, if the universe is a product of an Im imperfect mind, then the resolution fails. And if the universe isn't the product of a mind, then the resolution fails. And if we have no reasonable path to reach the conclusion that a perfect mind did it, then the resolution fails. That's a, that's a tough spot to be in, which is one of the reasons why it was interesting that this was more than just, oh, does God exist or does God probably exist? Um, we have exactly one universe to investigate. We don't have other universes to compare it to. We are limited in our ability to investigate, and we can't explore beyond the boundaries of space-time. And so any scientific exploration of those subjects is hypothetical or a mathematical uh, extrapolation or investigation that is speculative and based on assumptions, which is why you're likely to hear probabilistic uh, analyses. If you imagine that you're in a room and you've been in that room for your whole life and there's no windows or doors, don't ask me how this works. It's magic. We're going to hear a lot about magic, I'm sure. How thick are the walls? Well, until you can get outside the room, you have no way of telling how the wall, thick the walls are. Maybe the walls, ceiling, and floor all go on forever. Maybe the room is all that, that exists. But if you assert that there is something beyond those walls, that the walls have some thickness and there is some space behind there, you would need a way to demonstrate it. But if you're locked in that room and you have no way to explore outside of it, I don't know how you would do that. This is the position that we're in. What if you were to tell me that you were getting messages from outside the room when you can't even demonstrate that there is an outside, something that exists beyond space-time? This is the analogy. This is where we find ourselves. We inhabit space-time. We don't have the ability to explore beyond it that I'm aware of. And so after thousands of years of speculation, we're in a position where the God believers have firmly placed their deity beyond our ability to investigate. It's bad enough that space-time is outside our ability to investigate, but so is, as far as I can tell, a perfect mind. How do you tell the difference between a perfect mind and a mind that's almost perfect? How do you tell when the universe is the result of any mind, let alone a perfect one? What's the mechanism that confirms our result or that our universe is the result of a perfect mind, but another universe might be the naturally produced or the result of an imperfect mind? Because you would need to say that in some cases, uh, not a probabilistic thing, but a demonstration of the impossibility of the contrary to say that it is impossible for a universe to form absent a perfect mind as its progenitor. It's like trying to solve the problem of whether something is all powerful or very powerful. I did this, you know, in, in discussions uh, referred to maximal power. And it's interesting that Zach would use maximal greatness as a kind of stand in for what, what seems to be, I don't want to say it is, but it seems to be like a hyperbolic use of perfect. If something is more powerful than you, and it seems to be perfect, that's just your imperfect brain reaching a conclusion that you can't support. It's like saying, I know that I know that I know that I know that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's a profession of how confident you are, but it doesn't actually tell us what you know at all. And I'm not saddling Zach with that. It's just what popped in my head when I was thinking about it. So the other thing is, would a perfect mind need to create or choose to create anything at all, let alone imperfection? If you're perfect, then one would presume you lack nothing. You need nothing. You are missing nothing. There's no reason for you to do anything or create anything because there's nothing for you to learn or discover. You are complete. That would be perfection in the, in the greatness. And maybe the thing that the perfect being lacks is imperfection and it seeks imperfection. So it creates that. But if we're using perfection as sort of an abstract concept of the ultimate, then it couldn't be lacking those things. It's like saying God knows everything that's knowable, but he doesn't know what you're going to do. How is that the case? So without going into a, a rebuttal uh, 
immediately in my, my opening. One of the problems here is that if we want to just talk about, oh, here's a bunch of things that I think are better explained by theism, and theism is simpler, um, we can do that. The problem is that, and, and we'll get into it on each one of these, uh, I reject pretty much every assertion that Zach made um, and really am keen on interest. Demonstrate that theism is simpler than atheism. Demonstrate that simpler is relevant. I know you're trying to use a, 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 ver, a version of Occam's razor, but Occam's razor isn't about simplicity. It's about multiplying entities unnecessarily. Um, and theism has no explanatory power. It doesn't have better explanatory power. I'll get into the, the how and why of all these in, in the discussion. But the key here, I think, uh, is when Zach listed off the list of things that are more likely on theism. It's moral agency, moral knowledge, a good and beautiful world, uh, free agents, theistic belief, fine-tuning, meaning and purpose. But the key word in all of that, I bet I could sit here and ask people, what do you think the key word is in there? For me, the key word there is agents. And that is, there we are thinking agents, and that is all that is required to explain all of those other things. Because the truth is those agents are then going to be moral agents because there's interactions that you have to evaluate. Those agents are going to have moral opinions, uh, whether or not they have moral knowledge is a sub is a different thing. Those more, those agents are likely to look at the world and think that it is good and beautiful because it suits them, but they evolved to fit that world rather than the world being created for them. Zach mentioned a sunrise. There are people who might not think a sunrise is beautiful. Good and beautiful is somewhat subjective, but of course, the things living in an environment are going to be happy that the environment suits them for living. And if they didn't, they wouldn't be there to do that in the first place. And agents who are flawed thinkers are going to have theistic beliefs that aren't justified by evidence. They are going to see the world as if it was fine tuned for them rather than what is the most likely explanation from science, which is that we are tuned to fit the world that we live in. And we have our views and opinions about meaning, purpose, meaning and purpose. The only thing that is required for all of those things that, that Zach listed, is agents interacting. And from that, we're going to get right answers and wrong answers. But it's if you're, if you're a theistic model, if you're going to try to claim that it's more likely, any theistic model that has been proposed as an explanation for everything in the world that doesn't satisfy that condition was already a bad explanation to begin to. That is independent of whether or not it's true. Cool. Thanks for that. Again, right on time. And now we're going into open discussion. So, uh, Zach, do you want to start by picking up a point to discuss? Sure. Um, thanks for that, Matt. There's a lot of great points that I love that you brought up here. Maybe I'd love to start with just like evidence because um, I mean, we can talk about simplicity and talk about explanatory power. Um, so when I brought forth my facts um, of like saying, hey, there's that are better expected by like theism than atheism. Yeah. I, in the next slide, I talked about like saying like um, bringing like a broadly like Bayesian form of argument. We're saying like the probability of certain facts um, is more likely on like theism than atheism. If you were just say to grant that, and I know you wouldn't, um, but say that if you were to grant that one of these things was more likely on like the perfect hypo hypo the perfect mind hypothesis than like another like another hypothesis, would that be evidence for God then? Like if that's the case, like if I like, do you think my arguments like logically sound? I can bring back the slide if you need me to. Um, so I'd be curious about that before we get started on the specifics. Sure. Let me make sure I understand the question, right? You're asking me that if I were convinced that any given fact was in fact more likely upon the hypothesis that a perfect mind exists, would that be mm -hmm. evidence for a perfect mind? Yeah. Um, yes. But would it be sufficient evidence to warrant accepting that there was a perfect mind? No, because okay. in much the same way that like, if I dealt you I'm, I'm a magician and I, I can do things with a deck. Of, well, I used to be able to do things with a deck of cards. I can't really do as much anymore, but if I were to deal you 13 spades, it's more likely that that is a result of me cheating than that it happened naturally. Mm -hmm. But that is not, while it is evidence for the proposition that I perhaps cheated, it is not enough to warrant a conclusion that I cheated because we know that the perfect bridge hand or 13 spades um, has happened in games. Um, and that this is a possibility. And so you would need to, there would, there would need to be more than that. But what we're talking about here, when we say on the hypothesis, on the hypothesis that there is a perfect mind, I'm not sure that an imperfect mind can look at that and say, 
this is more likely with a perfect mind. H how do we tell that? Okay. Yeah, that's great. First, I want to say like with your like analogy and things, Matt, I totally agree with you. Like, I think this is super cool that like we can have some agreement that like, hey, if there's, and I, I can say the same thing in favor of atheism. Like, I think there's arguments that like provide weight towards atheism. Um, so I think that like there's evidence for atheism. And I'm, I mean, hard atheism. Anytime I'm bringing atheism here, I understand you disagree. Sure. Yeah, I get it. I and and I bring while, while I'm um, not necessarily here to defend strong atheism, hard atheism, it's not a problem. Mm -hmm. we, we, yeah. And if we want to swap words for the people who are confused, generally when we're talking about theism, we're on on the hypothesis that a God exists versus atheism mm -hmm. on the hypothesis that a God doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, so with your question with regards to like the indifferent mind, Matt, I'm going to say we just have to compare the theories um, in, the same, in a similar way as we do like scientific, like we have different theories, you explain different things. I'm going to say like, sure, let's bring forward like the perfect mind hypothesis. Let's bring maybe like the imperfect mind. Let's bring the evil mind. Um, let's say there's no mind and we have different theories. I'm going to say, like, when we compare the theories, like, whatever we bring out, like, I think my model is the best theory. Um, so maybe, like, maybe, like, a less than perfect mind. I would say that's just a more complex hypothesis that's going to hurt, take a hit on simplicity um, and things like that. So I think that, like, large story start, like, a lot of, not a lot of your opening, but a good bit, you're like, well, why say, like, there's a perfect mind rather than maybe, like, a 99% perfect mind or, like, you know, something in the middle. Um, I'm going to say, like, we should just compare the theories. And I think whatever theory um, that, like, a non-theistic hypothesis is going to have. Um, I think my theory is the best. So that's kind of how I see things. All right. I, I think I want to, just for clarity, in the same way that we're here clarifying the theism or atheism, um, somebody in chat is going to have their head explode if you keep swapping hypothesis and theory. You don't have a theory. You, you don't have a hypothesis that has been through testing and peer review and all the things to get to a graduation point of a theory. So we're not comparing he theory. We're comparing hypothesis and you don't even really have a hypothesis unless it's falsifiable and testable. So really what we have is um, a, a speculation on the loose hypothesis that there is a God. What would we expect? Well, it depends on the God, right? I mean, what, what, what is it like? Let's, let's pick one. Um, for example, you, you think that um, a good and beautiful world, is so more likely on theism than atheism, but isn't a good and beautiful world subjective? And isn't it the case that any being that finds itself in a world that's suitable for it is going to find things about that world that it views as good and beautiful and that it requires nothing more than that person's appreciation for the fact that, Hey, I can breathe. I can see, I can interact. I can, Oh, there's flowers there. They smell nice. Why do they smell nice? Do they smell nice for me? Do they smell nice for the bees? Uh, is it for a pollination thing? Is there some intent behind it or does this, is this just how it works? It's, it's really easy to say theism is simpler, but you could all, you know, the, the, the way in which you're, you're saying or suggesting that theism is simpler um, really doesn't fit. I don't think with um, sort of the Occam's razor approach to this, because I don't think theism is sim simple, simpler. Um, my, I, my position is that there's no reason to believe there's a God and tell there's sufficient evidence that warrants it. And so when the people um, who would say, hey, um, if a God exists, that's a better explanation for X than atheism. Except that not only is it th the fact that it's a better explanation or it is more consistent with it or what, it, that is about your expectations. That's about what you would expect if there is a God. You and I begin with the same universe, as far as I can tell. Um, and you're the one that's adding something to it. And by adding a God to it, the biggest thing there could be, you are adding a God, magnificent powers, um, the ability to do pretty much anything that's conceivable. That is not a simple hypothesis at all. That is an incredibly complex hypothesis. What you're saying is there's a magical box out there outside of space time or wherever you're going to place it. I'm not trying to put words in your mouth that can do anything and everything. And that becomes the explanation, the best explanation. And if there is a magical box out there, here's what we'd expect. That doesn't make it simpler. It just makes it more hidden. Okay. So there's a lot you just um, put out here, Matt, because we started with like um, looking at specific evidence under like explanatory power. And then you talked about like simplicity. Um, and I'd love to talk about simplicity um, too. Sure. But let's just, let's focus on explanatory power for a sec. Um, okay. So we talked about like the generic, like Bayesian argument um, and like, it seems like we agree that like, if that argument would run, like we'd have some evidence for theism. Um, you mentioned the good and beautiful world. 
if it's okay with you, I'd love to talk about the embodied conscious more agents first. Cause that's what you said. Sure. Like everything else seems to like fall like underneath. Um, so here's a test. Like my friend Tim talked about this, um, where we could say like, maybe not the same as a scientific test, but a philosophical test, um, to say that like, I'm gonna say my theory like would explain this better than like an atheistic theory. So, um, saying that like a perfect mind created the universe, um, this being is like perfect. So it's morally perfect. Um, so if it's morally perfect, I would say that he would care about the existence of moral agents. Um, the existence of moral agents would be more likely under this hypothesis than a view of the world where fundamental reality is just indifferent to moral agents and just doesn't give a crap whether moral agents exist. Because um, you think about like epistemically all the different ways um, things could have gone just from like the principle of indifference, knowing that um, that I would say that like given all the different possibilities, one where that there are these moral agents would be more likely under a view where there's a morally perfect being that would like these agents than a view that would not. And I'm not saying this proved God exists or anything like that. I just say this is an evidential chip that provides some evidence in favor of the theistic hypothesis. So what do you think about that? Sure. It seems to me that when you say under the hypothesis that a perfect mind would care about moral agents, we've, we've skipped past an important part of why would it create moral agents or agents at all in the first place, but let's assume that it did. It also seems like you're ignoring all of the other factors that one would expect. So I'm sorry. I, I know you don't like being interrupted. Um, I could say like, you could say like, and I have friends like Emerson green. He's an atheist. He has a great pod podcast. To counter apologetist, counter apologetist. He would say like, yeah, there is like these moral agents that provide some evidence. And if you bring up like suffering and hitterness and all these things, like, yeah, these things exist and they provide evidence like contrary, but like, we still have with moral agents, like this, some evidence pushing us towards theism. And I'm sorry. I won't interrupt again, Matt. Um, that's my bad, but I wanted to just bring that up. Sure. So what you seem to be saying is that on, on, on theism, we would expect the, the, the God to care about moral agents, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why wouldn't that God also um, act perfectly to make sure that those agents have a perfect understanding of morality? Why wouldn't that God also interact to make sure those agents don't disagree about what moral views are and things like that? We're skipping past all of the problems, all of the things that seem to be um, counter indicators and, and potentially defeaters for the proposition and focusing only on one simple thing, if God, then people. That that ignores or, or moral agents. If God, then moral agents, and that ignores all the factors about moral agents, which is we don't agree on moral issues. We've had and and our moral views have changed over time. And if God, uh, if there is a God and He creates moral agents, why is He completely hidden? Why isn't He answering the questions? Why isn't He giving us new information? Why isn't He demonstrating His existence? Why isn't He? Um, showing the people who are wrong in their moral conclusions how they should be right. Aren't those okay, the yeah. things we would expect under theism as well? Yeah, I love this, Matt. I love what you're doing because um, it follows, it seems like right, like we're kind of agreeing on this fundamental method. Um, like we could talk about like hiddenness and disagreement and suffering. Like I'm, I'm cool with that. But I guess my goal I'm starting with is smaller than that. Um, I'm trying to like establish like there is evidence for the existence of God. And I could say like, like for now, I could say like, sure, Matt, let's just say that like suffering and like changing morality and disagreement, let's say these all count against God. All I'm trying to say right now at this point in the context of the debate is say like, even if it's like really, 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 really tiny, like there is some evidence for God because of moral agents. Um, like, what do you think about that? Would you say, yes, there is no, there isn't. Cause I know there's all these other chips and like for the sake of where we're at right now in this context, I'm fine. Like giving those to you. Um, though I obviously would push back. But I'm just saying at this moment, when we look at moral agents, this is like some, even if you want to say it's really tiny evidence that pushes us in favor of the guy hypothesis. It doesn't, it should, doesn't and shouldn't push it at all. The fact that there is, the fact that there are facts that are consistent with the hypothetical explanation for those facts is absolutely trivial. What, 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 mm -hmm. what, what, what sort of proposed explanation for facts would it be if it wasn't consistent with the facts? Mm-hmm. Well, I think I'm trying to get at this like no evidence claim. Like if you're going to say there's no evidence for the existence Wait, no, of God, no, 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 no. Hang there's on. no facts. Um, this debate was supposed to be about whether or not a perfect mind created the universe. At no at what point did I say there's no evidence? I never said you said that. I'm just trying to say okay, that. Okay, then why are we sitting here talking about something I haven't said? I wasn't, if I, if I said, if I put it on you that you said that, that's my bad, Matt. I wasn't trying to push this on you because you clearly have not said that. All I'm trying to do at this point is say, hey, there are these things. 
that are going to push us. Like there is evidence for God that's going to push us in that direction of a perfect mind creating the universe. That's and, all I'm trying to and, do at this and point. And what I'm what I'm saying is the fact that there are facts that are consistent with the explanation for the your, your your proposed explanation for those facts is absolutely trivial. I would not consider that evidence for a proposition. The mere fact that there are facts that are consistent with something, like the fact that there's a dead body, is consistent with the butler did it as a hypothesis. Okay. It doesn't, it isn't a fact that points to the butler killing someone. It is a fact that we're trying to explain. We have a dead body. You've proposed, not you, somebody has proposed that the butler has done it. And then they say, look, there's a dead body there. That is evidence for the proposition that the butler killed him. No, that's an evidence for, the, for somebody being dead. It's potentially evidence for somebody killing them. And until you draw the connection that necessarily ties those two, it's not an evidence for a proposition. You've come up with a hypothesis. And the only thing that you can point to and, and you seem really keen on this. Oh, I want to make sure that nobody can walk away from here saying there's no evidence for God. Well, I'm not aware of any evidence that is expressly for a proposition and exclusive of other propositions. Well, I think any of you can explain any of the data for the most part. Um, so that's interesting. Um, so I just want to get to this. And the probability of embodied moral conscious agents. I would say this is more expected under theism than atheism. I'm using theism as a perfect mind created the universe. Do you agree or disagree with that? Um, I, I, I don't have any way to assess that because on theism, on, on theism as a proposition where there's a perfect mind, my expectation was that we, it would be the only thing. There was no point to or need to create anything at all, let alone create imperfection and and not provide all of the other things with it. The, the defeaters are all of the other factors. But also, I don't have any, we have one universe and we have one set of facts to assess. And what we know is that there are conscious agents. Um, I have no way of evaluating whether that's more likely on, I mean, I'd need a more specific theism. If your proposition is there is a theistic God that wants to create moral agents, well, then, yes, it's more likely on that hypothesis um, than it is on there is a, a universe that is following naturalistic progression. But that naturalistic process, um, as far as we can tell, led to us. So the odds of it happening are one. Or the probability of it happening, sorry, is one. And odds would require a different formulation. Okay, so originally, like um, you said, like, no, we like we you th you think that like God wouldn't create anything. Then you said, like, say, like, you believe that there's a perfect mind or, like, a, a God that would want to create embodied moral agents. Then you say, like, yes, that would be, like, evidence in favor of, like, that hypothesis. I, I Can you say it one more time? I don't think I followed it. Yeah, I'm sorry. So it seemed like to me you said, like, assuming that there is some sort of, like, perfect, like, being that would want to create moral agents, then, like, yes, the existence of, like, us would be more expected on that hypothesis than, like, an indifferent hypothesis. And, like, you're you're fine saying that. No, I don't know. I don't know. So I don't have any way to calculate or approximate the probability. Um, if, if the proposition is a theistic God who wants to create imperfect, a perfect theistic God who wants to create imperfect beings exists, then on that hypothesis, um, it, we would expect to see imperfect beings, but I don't know how to, how to determine whether that's more or less likely than if there is no uh, perfect theistic God, what what are the what's the likelihood of uh, moral agents arising? Or however, I, I'm, I apologize if we've we've changed terms a couple of times. Um, I don't I don't know how to evaluate that. I don't have anything to compare it to. I don't have any other universes to look at. All I can look at it is what is, and then you have proposed an explanation, and the explanation you proposed of of a perfect mind. Uh, I think that comes with a lot of other factors. And my question then is, okay, um, certainly if there's a perfect mind that wants to create things, we would expect there to be created things. But there are other expectations I would have. I, of a perfect mind, I would have expected it to create perfect things. Mm -hmm. So in your view then, like, like, yes, maybe there is, say that claim that there is like some being that wants um, people like us, like there is some evidence, like even if it's really tiny for it, because like we in fact exist, but then we're looking at all these other things um, that like really push us against that idea. Do I have you right? 
you, you, you seem really desperate to get me to say that there's evidence for God. And what I've said repeatedly is that when I say there's evidence for a proposition, I'm not willing to just say these facts are consistent with this hypothesis. It is these facts are exhaustively or, and or exclusively consistent with that hypothesis. I don't want to say there's evidence for God, just like a dead body isn't evidence for the proposition that a butler killed that body. Mm-hmm. Well, can't, I guess we maybe can go a little bit different direction. Like, couldn't like any theory explain all the facts? Like, this is like, like we still have, like, I'm not a young earth creationist. But, like, young earth creationists can come up with all sorts of like crazy explanations to like explain the facts of say, like, um, like decay and things like this. Like, isn't this why, um, like, like surely like anyone can like can have an explanation to explain all the data. Like, it's not like we're going to have some theory that can like explain everything away um, and make no other theory like totally like, and like shut everyone up for like all of eternity. Like, to me, it seems like like any theory can explain all the data, even if it's like really, really crappy explanations. No, most, well, most theories don't, apart from perhaps a theory of everything, which is not my, mm-hmm. yeah, that's something else. Explain facts within a particular realm, a narrow realm. I mean, you've mm-hmm. basically tried to come up with a, a theory of everything. And, and the hypothesis is that there's a perfect being. Um, and I, I, it, until we, I don't know how to demonstrate, I don't know how anybody could demonstrate that a perfect being is possible or how to identify one or what a perfect being would do. All this seems to be is Zach has some expectations of what the world would look like if there was the God that he believes exists. And if he defines that God, I'm going to have expectations of what the world will look like. But what I know right now is what the world looks like. And uh, it's also consistent with a magical being outside of space time that just decided not to intervene or give a crap about any of us at all. That's, that's there. It's also consistent with there being 12 uh, perfect beings uh, who don't interact um, or haven't provided evidence or haven't given these, you could just keep doing this endlessly. And in that case, why stop at one being? Why not two or three or five or 10 or 12? And so that's where we get into Occam's razor talking about multiplying entities unnecessarily. The difference between the two of us is that you're wanting to multiply it to one perfect being, and I'm not. I'm I'm at zero right now. Sure, but in place of that zero, um, and this is why I think if if people get a chance, read the debate book between Oppie um, and Kenny Pierce, um, because like you could like sure you can say zero, but in place of that zero, like and maybe like Matt, like I'm not saying you have to have an explanation right now as we have this debate in October 21st, 2022, but like. Surely, like in places at zero, there's something like Oppie would talk about, like his idea of like a hypothesis of a foundational, like initial state. Um, that's going to create everything. Um, and like Kenny Pearson, in that debate book pushes back and says, like, hey, like this theistic theory, um, is going to do a better job explaining these things. Like you may say, like, sure, there's zero gods, and I might say, yeah, there's one god. Um, but in place of like that question of like explaining, like, why is there anything at all? Like, what's foundational? Um, if anything, like, there's got to be something on that, like. If you're going to say there's zero, not, if there's nothing on the like statistic side, there's got to be something that's going to fill in that um, explanation for, for why there's got to be anything at all. So what, what, I'm, what I'm talking about here is, is there some explanation for the universe? Sure. Do we know what it is? No. I agree. Um, could it be that it's a perfect God? I don't know because I don't know if a perfect God's possible. Could it be that the universe is is entirely explained without appealing to a perfect God. I have no idea. It doesn't seem to be anything that we could rule out. So when you're putting in a God and I'm putting in zero gods, that doesn't mean I'm saying there's no explanation. I'm saying you've narrowed the explanation to a specific type of explanation, and I haven't. I'm open to whatever explanation actually is the result of the evidence and argument. Well, I'd like to say the same thing that like, I think I'm open to whatever explanation is like the evidence and the argument. I just think the evidence and the arguments are going to favor my theory over your theory. So I, I don't think that's a, something that like you can just have. I, I don't um, have a theory. Mm-hmm. I just, yeah. I just acknowledge I don't have an explanation for the, for the universe. What I'm doing is responding to people who are saying the best explanation for the universe is a perfect mind. And I'm, I'm mm-hmm. saying, okay, demonstrate that a perfect mind is possible. Define a perfect mind. Show me how you identify a perfect mind versus a nearly perfect mind. How do you demonstrate that the universe is the product? Probabilistic arguments like this are never, ever, ever going to convince me. 
and shouldn't convince anyway. Bayesian analysis is based is entirely conditioned on the priors, and priors would essentially for the for a universe require other universes, and you don't have any, so you have no priors. So you're doing best guesses at best. In this case, you're not even doing Bayesian analysis. You're actually just looking at say, on the hypothesis that there's a God that can create and wants to create, it will create, or creation is likely or expected. Yes, that's true. But on the hypothesis that the butler wanted to kill the person, then the dead body becomes you know, evidence for the proposition. But that's not the way evidence works. Okay, so what do you, like, I've heard you say demonstration a lot. Like, what do you mean by demonstration, Matt? Show it. So what do you mean? But what do you mean by show it? Like, empirically show it? Like, just show that it's more likely than another? Like, what do you mean by show it? Uh, so here's the thing is you're asking me how you're asking me how I should demonstrate what you believe. I don't know. This is what people, people ask me all the time. What would change your mind about a God? I don't know. But if there is mm-hmm. a God that God should know, and he should be capable of doing it. And the fact that he hasn't done it means that he either doesn't exist or doesn't want me to know he exists. So you're the one who's coming in here with a hypothesis. Why would you ask me how to demonstrate it? You need to demonstrate it. I don't think it can be demonstrated. I've seen no way for anybody. It's the same thing with space-time. People say God exists outside of space-time. How do you know there is anything outside of space-time? How do you know that that there's a being that could exist outside of space-time? To me, existence is necessarily temporal, and existence in its normative sense is spatial and temporal. So to say something exists outside of space-time is nonsense to me. And so when you are saying, I, I'm an imperfect mind, but I've reached the conclusion that there's a perfect mind behind all of this. That's a cool assertion. Why do you think there's a perfect mind and how could you tell? Yeah, that's good. So why I asked you like what a demonstration is and like, like what would that mean to you is because I don't think a demonstration of God is like necessary. I don't think you really need to demonstrate um, much of anything to really rationally believe it. What I think you need is because I don't think demonstrations, like while they're great, um, again, like any of you can explain all the data. That's why we still have young earth creationists, um, who like, it seems like it's very impossible to hold to, but they can come up with all sorts of theories to explain it. Even if there's clear evidence, like against young things like young earth creationism, all I'm saying is like, if we're going to say like God exists, I'm saying like my two simple claims, there's things that have like, they're more expected if God exists than if God does not exist and theism simpler than atheism. And those two things are going to push us in favor of theism. And I know you disagree with those, but like, I think if those two claims are true, then we have really good reason to be a theist over um, some other view of things. Yeah. So first of all, creationism doesn't explain all the facts. Creationism explains uh, a narrow po- subset of the facts. When you look at all the facts, it, it debunks creationism. So you can't say, well, if you agree with me, then why were you saying that any theory or any model can explain all the facts and then use creationism example when neither one of us think creationism comes even remotely close to, to explaining all the facts. Meanwhile, when you say you don't think demonstrations are important, Well, we are never going to reach agreement then because I'm a skeptic and I want to believe things when there's a good reason to. And that requires a demonstration. It requires a sound argument supported by evidence and facts, not just a, hey, this is more likely under my hypothesis. Because under the hypothesis that there are universe creating pixies, we would expect a universe and we have a universe. So therefore, the existence of the universe is evidence for universe creating pixies in the exact same extent that it is to a perfect mind creating it. That is, your hypothesis is not discrete enough. It is not testable. It is not falsifiable. It is, it is not scientific. And so it's really easy to propose explanations and then say, I don't care about demonstrations. Well, some of us do, and some of us aren't going to believe things until there's a demonstration. And in a world, in a world, sorry, I, I didn't mean to do the, the movie thing. It was just in my head. In, in the world we inhabit, if you take 10 people and five of them refuse to believe something until there's a good, solid demonstration for it, and the other five say they don't need a demonstration to warrant belief, I would say, as long as we're approximating probabilities, that the five who are expecting and waiting for evidence are going to have a more accurate model of the universe than the five who aren't. Yeah, I guess I, I guess I should clarify, Matt, um, by demonstration. I was saying in terms of like demonstrations, I was thinking more like logical demonstrations where there's like a direct thing where like we have A and this necessarily follows like B is true. Um, like I do think like demonstrations, like if you mean like chains of reasoning that lead to conclusions, like, yeah, like those are super important. And they're valuable. 
Um, so what I'm trying to understand is like, what do you mean by a demonstration? Like a, something that like gives us a hundred percent certainty that something is true, like 99%, like, cause I, like, I'm just trying to understand what you mean because sure. I think it's important. We're looking at like demonstrating God exists. Like, what do you mean by demonstrating God exists? Cause I don't know what you mean by like a logical demonstration, something else, like what's going on here. It's funny that you said, you said you weren't talking about a logical demonstration. And then you said you were talking about chains of reasoning. That's a logical demonstration. A logical demonstration is a chain of reasoning. And I don't think you can be absolutely certain of, of anything. So I'm not advocate and I've never advocated for absolute certainty. As a matter of fact, I'm, uh, I'm reject the concept of absolute certainty because, um, well, the foundations of epistemology don't allow you to be absolutely certain. And you can't, ha you can't be more confident in the, in the result than you can from the tool that provided the result. So, this is why I went with maximal certainty or maximal confidence for that. Mm -hmm. but when, once again, you're back to asking me what sort of demonstration would prove God. And it depends on the God. And my answer is most of the time, I don't know, but I'm not the one claiming that I've demonstrated it. When, when, when people say that they, they can demonstrate God, that's up to them. Like you, you think you've demonstrated a strong probability for the hypothesis. I don't think you've demonstrated anything other than what you think about what the world would be like if there was a God. Okay. So do we have like, Matt, do we have demonstration? Do we have a demonstration that like other minds exist? So as far as I know, there's no solution to the problem of hard solipsism, but mm -hmm. I'm convinced that hard solipsism is false because I personally find it preposterous to think that I've written every great novel and every great song mm -hmm. and that I have been every caller um, into the show who's been frustrated and confused. Um, it, it seems to me more of a leap to presume that all of this is a fiction. And it seems to me uh, just intuitively more reasonable that I share a mind with others. But do we have a way to demonstrate that? Not that I know of. Okay. So then like, do I need to have like some sort of like, by that same like standard definition, do I like that same, sorry, that same standard of like, um, like what a demonstration is like, then I don't need a demonstration of God either, right? If we don't have one for other minds, do I need one to have one? Do I need to have one for God? Or can I just say, like, like you said, like we have really good reason to think that that solipsism hypothesis is false. Cause like, I mean, you're not, I'm like, I didn't write all the books in the world. Um, so like, like, do you understand what I'm saying? Like, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, w one of the things is that uh, what we're actually talking about at this moment, if I'm understanding it correctly, is uh, there are certain, um, presuppositions that we all need to make. And one of the presuppositions that I make is that I am inter I'm sharing a universe with other people and that I am interacting with them. Um, mm -hmm. That is an assumption that I have to make as a practicality because I am aware that if I begin to live my life as if I am the only mind and the only person that matters, I will die. If I begin to live my life as if the reality that I experience isn't real, I will most certainly die. Uh, at least that's the evidence from what I've seen from supposed other people. But all of it together, I could test that. But I don't want to test that because I'd rather not die. I'd like to live. Mm -hmm. There is no practical necessity that requires me to make a decision about whether or not there is a God. Okay, I'm just, I'm trying to understand, like, where our disagreement is here. Like, it seems like we're both agreeing. Like, yeah, I just don't really, like, I'm I'm happy with where we're at right now. I don't really see... Like, I'm just saying a demonstration of God isn't needed. Um, and it doesn't seem like you'd push back on that. And if you, well, like, a demonstration of God, you may believe in a God without a demonstration. You may do it as intuitive. Somebody else may do it because of a census divinatus or, or whatever, whether it's real or perceived or anything else. Mm -hmm. um, I have no reason to be stuck. In, so there are, there are some things where you kind of got to make up your mind at least about how you're going to behave with regard to an issue, not with, you know, with regard to, to the truth. So I'm going to behave as if you and I share a universe, uh, because firstly, I, I find it preposterous that we don't. I think it would be arrogant and dismissive. If I'm wrong about it, then I'm just being a dick to everybody by assuming that they're all just figments of my imagination or being injected or whatever else. And so as a matter of practical necessity, I have to interact with the world as I experience it. As a matter of practical necessity, I don't have to decide that they're what the explanation of the universe is. I, I, I can I can sit here. It'll be dissatisfying. It'll nag at me. But I don't have to say, you know what? I've been around for 53 years. I've heard a lot of stuff. It's about time I decided what I think the explanation of the universe is. That is preposterous to me because the time to decide what you think the explanation of the universe is is when there's a demonstration 
supported by evidence for what the universe is. And if you're in a position where you don't want to care about demonstration, that's, it's fine for you. But certainly, if I told you I believed something without demonstration, it would be absurd for me to think that you were somehow deficient in reason if you didn't accept the things that I accept. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I don't think you're deficient in reason at all. So maybe let's like look at something like controversial, like the nature, like say like the nature of like how quantum mechanics relates to like general relativity and like, all this. this can fun can we stuff. not? Um, like, so here's, here's the point. I don't know the theory super it's well. Like, not, I'm it's not a not my, here's the problem me, is it's not my field at all. I'm looking at me either. I'm just trying to think in a more then, like. Then why, 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 what good would it do for two of us to sit down and speculate about something that's not even remotely uh, our field? Here, here's here's my question for you, Matt. Was yeah. like, is it rational to hold any belief right now on like, are the scientists in, in the field studying this? Are they rational to know. hold a belief about it? Even if I, they I don't know. I, I think. False? I think um, I think there are some aspects of string theory that have, have been mathematically demonstrated, but most of them, um, I think, are almost magical speculation that are potentially unfalsifiable, and I don't hold views on them. But I have zero expertise in the area. And so when I have no expertise in the area, uh, I either don't have a view on it or I rely on the scientific consensus. And my confidence in that consensus is supposed to be proportional to the evidence and the strength of that consensus. And so if, if there's uh, a proposition that's, that's uh, dubious, um, I'm probably not going to hold to it. I go with where the evidence read, the, the empirical evidence. Um, yeah, so when it comes, I, I, I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, string theory is nonsense or quantum mechanics is nonsense. I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. It seems to be that the people who are experts in it um, Sometimes it looks like they're making stuff up and uh, wishful thinking and seeking out an explanation that is on par with mysticism to me. And other times it's like, wow, that's really impressive. I wish I understood it better. But neither of them have anything to do with whether or not there's a perfect mind and whether or not it's reasonable to reach that conclusion. And if you're going to say it's reasonable to reach the conclusion and that you don't require a demonstration, then how many other things are you willing to accept? without a demonstration that are that aren't necessary like it's not necessary to reach a conclusion for the origin of the universe is it is it is there something like a person could live their entire life live and die and never reach a conclusion about the origin of the universe what would be the problem with that so the point the, the whole point of me asking the quantum mechanics question just going back to that is like all I was trying to like make sure we agreed on was like we can have rational disagreement in light of us like not having some like near certainty uh, hypothesis which seems like you're cool with like we're cool with having rational disagreement like we can be rational and have different views of things so I, I'm, that's all i'm, I'm trying cool to say with it in the sense that i don't know i'm not saying i'm not necessarily saying it's rational i i can't reach the conclusion about whether or not these things in quantum mechanics are rational or not because i don't know that i don't have enough you, you might as well be saying speaking uh german and asking me if that sentence was constructed properly i've never studied german i don't know about german i'm going to trust that a german speaker is probably going to get it right but um, that doesn't mean that what they said is rational. And so if I don't understand quantum mechanics, I, it would be wrong for me to say it's rational. But what I'm asking is how many things, what would, what would be the problem of someone living their entire life and not reaching a conclusion about what the explanation for the universe is? Like they just live their life and they just like, they're not like, they're just not worried about it. What's the problem with that? Well, no, no, no. They can be worried about it. I can sit here my entire life and, and be just, uh, crippled with anxiety over the fact that I haven't reached a conclusion. But what would be the, the the problem with saying, I don't know what the explanation is for the universe all the way till the day you die? What's wrong with that? Well, in one sense, like I would say, like, I don't know. Like, I don't have complete certainty on like that. The Knowledge isn't certainty. I've already rejected certainty. <laughs> I'm saying I have what it would be wrong with never saying, I believe that I now have an explanation for the universe. What would be wrong with never saying that? Belief, not knowledge. I wouldn't say there's anything like implicitly wrong with saying like I don't have an explanation. I just think that like okay. Um, we've got about ten minutes left of open discussion, or maybe we could go fifteen. So if, I don't know if you guys want to switch to another subject. We could talk about simplicity if you want, because we didn't really talk about it. we talked about explanatory power, and obviously it seems like I don't know like, that we talked agree. about explanatory power. <laughs> wherever because, you want to take this map maybe we get into either sure. explanatory power so, or simplicity I'm, I'm good wherever my claim my claim is that we explain things in terms of other things we understand 
we okay. we have we begin. It, it's a it's a building up process. We mm -hmm. understand arithmetic and then we move on to higher mathematics. And so we start looking at the universe and we come up with an explanation for why it appears that the sun is is circling the earth. And we come up with an explanation that is consistent with the available facts, and that is that the sun orbits the earth. And then when we get new facts and information that throws this uh, under the bus, and now we recognize that, oh, what's actually happening is the earth is spinning on its axis and it's orbiting the sun, and this is the explanation for it. We built up to that explanation. We explain things in terms of other things that we understood better. At no point can it be considered an explanation to say, what's the explanation for this? And then appeal to something that we do not understand. You can't say the explanation for this is magic. And so the theistic proposition or the notion that there, the hypothesis that there, there is a God doesn't do anything edifying. It doesn't explain a single thing. It is functionally, logically identical to magic man done it. It is not an explanation for anything. It satisfies some people because people will say, wow, why is there something rather than nothing? And the answer is, because that's what God wanted. That's not an explanation. Nothing. There's nothing clarified, nothing expanded, nothing demonstrated, nothing clearly true. It is a pacifier and a panacea that says, hey, we don't know, so we'll make something up. That's not explanatory. Yeah, well, I'd agree with, I think I'd agree with a lot of you. I'm just not saying that, well, we don't really know what this is. So I'm going to say like, hey, here's my theism theory that fits really nice into that. So I, I mean, I think I agree with a lot of what you're saying. I just wouldn't say that that's what I'm doing. What I'm saying is, is going back to the beginning is we're comparing the theories. I'm saying that there's a, my theory is, I mean, I'm not starting from like going from like, it seems like your theory is more, not theory, but like you're trying to go more bottom up. And I'm saying more, let's start at the top. Like we have these different like overarching theories of the world where I'm going to say there's a perfect mind. And then there's different theories. And I'm saying if you compare the theories starting from the top and going down, like I think the theistic theory just best explains everything we experience in the world. Not every, well, maybe not everything, but it's more like it's the best explanation of things. That's what How I'm does it explain say. anything? What, what, what new information does it add that gives us a better understanding? Yeah. So I'm going to go back to that Bayesian argument I made in the beginning where I'm going to say the probability of certain facts like moral agents or moral knowledge, um, Theistic belief, cosmic fine tuning, and these facts are just better explained by my theory than other theories. So that's how I would say that theism explains things. So I would like for everybody to rewind to the beginning, to the end of my question and the beginning of that response, because what I asked was, how does it explain anything? And what you said is, it explains things. I said, I'm sorry if I misspoke. I said there's certain facts, going back to my open statement, that are more expected on the hypothesis that God exists than the hypothesis or like the idea that God does not exist. So that's that, how I'm saying. That That saying. is about what you think is more likely. There is nothing in that that offers an explanation. There's nothing in there that gives any new information other than it, you're saying that it is more consistent with the theistic hypothesis that there would be moral agents. But that is an assertion that is about what you would expect. And it explains nothing. It doesn't explain why there are moral agents. It is just asserting that there are moral agents and that's consistent with your proposed hypothesis. But it doesn't explain anything. It doesn't tell us how. It doesn't tell us why. It doesn't give us any information at all. It is logically identical, identical to because I said so, which is the answer that all of us got fed up with as kids. When our parents say, you're going to do this because I said so, that is the most dissatisfying answer. It is the least scientific answer. It's the least edifying answer. It is the least explanatory answer, and that is exactly what the God hypothesis is right down the line. Well, I was trying to keep things simple. Like, obviously, you could paint a full picture. Like, if you read, um, like, Swinburne does a great job in the book, the, the Existence of God, trying to paint a full picture of, like, why God would want X, Y, and Z. It's um, so like we could say, like, say because God is morally perfect, he's going to care about the existence of moral agents. Um, so, like, the existence of moral agents would be expected if God exists. So maybe there's a good reason just to think that, like, if God exists, there would be these moral agents like you and me. Like, we could get the picture more, like, more detailed and detailed. It's just like we're in a little debate. So I can't paint the full picture for you in 45 minutes. Well, I, I, my, my point is that neither you nor anybody else has painted any sort of picture that is based on a demonstration. It, it, this is, and I apologize. I, well, I, I'm going to offend people with what I said, whether I apologize or not. 
um, to borrow something um, from my former colleague, Tracy Harris, when Swinburne talks about, here's why we think God might have done this and why we do this, these are all post hoc rationalizations that still have no tie to anything. It's like talking about Bigfoot breeding patterns and habits and saying, this is why you don't see big feet or Bigfoots or Sasquatches, uh, because they're, they're, what we've learned about their culture is that they are solitary and they hide and they, they breed and they live a long time and they live in a cave. And this is, this is all the reasons why it's so difficult for you to see Bigfoot but they're all just post hoc rationalizations. There's nothing behind them, and they didn't provide any sort of explanation um, that is tied to reality. So when, when Swinburne or somebody else says, oh, here's why God would do this or not this, that is entirely based on presuppositions or things that he's convinced of about a God or what is defined in the God hypothesis. It has nothing to do with reality, just like Bigfoot breeding patterns. Well, we could say we could tease these things out from like the idea of like reality being fundamentally perfect, and this is why simplicity matters. Um, because like with your big foot, with your bigfoot like idea, I think you might like you could explain like you could sure you could come up with some bigfoot hypothesis and explain all the data of why like it exists, but we don't see it or whatever. Da, da, da. But like your simplicity with that theory, like that's gonna take a big hit when you have to add all these things in that we just don't know about. Um, so. Yeah, uh, I'm happy to. I, I I agree with you that the Bigfoot hypothesis is going to take a big hit when you add in all the things that we don't know about, it. and so is the God one, which is why at the beginning when we talked about what what God's expectations were, of course, if you expect that a God will create moral agents, that becomes an explanation for moral agents. But it doesn't explain why the, the God wouldn't present Himself. It doesn't explain why God wouldn't clarify confusion about moral agency. You're ignoring all of those other things when it comes to God, but you want to bring them up when it comes to Bigfoot. So the analogy holds. Well, I'm not ignoring them. I'm just saying that if you compare to evidential chips, I think there's more in favor of theism than atheism. Like, I'm fine saying there's evidential yeah, chips yes. in favor of atheism. I mean, you can keep saying that all day long, but that isn't edifying either. You can keep saying all day long that you are convinced that these things are best explained by theism, but they don't explain anything. There's what, what's the explanation? What what new information does it? So if we say okay, we know there are moral agents, we know there are views about morality, we know there's a world that some think are good and wonderful, we know there are agents, we know there's theistic belief, we uh, we know that people believe there's fine tuning and people care about meaning and purpose. What is it about saying all of those things are more likely on theism that adds anything at all to our understanding? Because I'm going back to that Bayesian style argument where I'm saying these facts, the probability of these facts on my hypothesis of theism are more likely than the hypothesis of atheism. And when we look at these facts and see they exist, since I since we believe that like since I think we can make arguments that there's good reasons to think that there's probably the probability of them is higher on theism, like since they exist, like they're gonna be evidence in favor of theism, which just pushes us towards that direction. So I think it's because that they're more likely on the theistic hypothesis than the atheistic hypothesis that they are evidence that pushes us in favor of theism. So that's why I think the probability of them is higher on the theistic hypothesis. Yeah, I asked I asked what that hypothesis adds as an explanatory sense, and all you did was reiterate that you think it's more likely. I mean, rewind it and listen to it. If you, if you tried to construct a syllogism out of what you just said, it would not have anything to do with new explanatory stuff. Why don't think I know, I know be, we got to get... Why, why does it have to be new stuff? Like, we've known these things... Because that's what explanation is. Explanation increases your understanding of the how and why behind something. If you say, how does a car work? And, and, and I say, because it works. And, and, or if you say, how does my car you know, move from A to B? And, I'm, and I say, because it's got an engine and you don't know what an engine is and I can't show you and nobody can tell you anything. I've added nothing explanatory. We explain things in terms of other things we understand. And so we could start mm -hmm. talking about an engine and say, okay, how does this engine work? Ah, well, we use fuel in the sense of gasoline, and we aerate that, and we light it up, and that creates a, a pressure differential that drives this piston, which moves this thing here, which it, and we can go through it step by step, and that's an explanation for how a car works. Saying it's got an engine, especially if there's no demonstration that an engine exists or what an engine is, doesn't explain anything. So if you're going to talk about the explanatory power of a, of a, of a model, it can't just be, well, why? how does this... When I asked, what, what does this add explanatory power? And what does it explain? And you say, well, it's just more likely on theism. That's not an explanation at all or anything. So you're, it seems like to me then like you reject, are you rejecting that original like, like kind of like idea of evidence that I was bringing forward where I said like the probability of certain facts are like higher on like 
if a probability of a fact is higher on one hypothesis than another, then it's evidence for that hypothesis hypothesis like so would you reject that yeah, i rejected that an hour ago when i was explaining that the mere fact that a fact is consistent with a proposed explanation is absolutely trivial it is it is unimpressive what sort of explanation could you have that doesn't provide some sort of that that isn't consistent with a fact that would be a really bad explanation you say why is the sky pink because it's green that's that's an explanation that that not only explains nothing but it's inconsistent with the facts and if you say why is the sky blue and you say because it is well that's an explanation that's consistent with the facts but it has no explanatory power it didn't add anything so i'm confused because way back in the beginning of when we started talking it seemed like to me you said like sure like assume that there is like like a god that wants moral agents like that fact would be more likely on like a theistic view than like an atheistic view since they do exist and that was some no. evidence which followed my argument so you you're, you're not going you, then misunderstand you guess in the beginning then no I, th I believe and i'd have to go back and listen to it again but i'll just correct it here and it'll be if i got it wrong earlier my apologies um mm -hmm. i would say that the mere fact that a fact is more consistent with one hypothesis than another does not mean it is evidence for that hypothesis it's evidence that is consistent with it and it doesn't mean that that hypothesis adds anything or explains anything at all and when we're, in this case, what we're talking about is you are just asserting that on your concept of what a God is, X is more likely under that model than it is under atheism. You haven't demonstrated that at all because at no point have you looked at the model that does not have a God and, and determined how likely a, an agent is under that model. And since we only have the one universe, we, we know the probability of it happening is one. We don't have any example of a universe where agents don't exist. And so how do you determine the likelihood of that, given physics? How do you know the probability is one? Like, are you rejecting because it the happened. view of the world that's indeterminate? Because it happened. Um, we'll move on to one. questions. It happened. We'll move on to questions okay. now. But Zach, do you want to just have one last go at uh, explaining why something being consistent with a theory is a reason to believe the theory? So I would just encourage people to go back through the slides. Um, so when I'm looking at explanatory power, I'll just reread the slide. I'm not claiming that atheism cannot explain these facts, but rather these phenomena are more likely to exist if God exists than if God does not exist. So for example, if the probability of certain facts, say like embodied moral conscious agents, is high on theism, but it's low on atheism, this would be some evidence that favors theism over atheism. That's what I was trying to establish. And if you're confused with that, just encourage you to re-look over those slides. Do you want to tie that into the Butler analogy that Matt gave? To be honest, I didn't fully understand Matt's Butler analogy, so I don't want to misrepresent him or anything like that. So if Matt wants to do that, go ahead. I just don't have anything to add there. Uh, let's get to questions. Yeah, I think let, it stands on I've talked about before. I can talk about it again some other time. Okay, cool. I think I've got this working. So there's a few super chats, and then we'll get on to the rest of the questions. So Realist Realist is asking, since beliefs are neurological states, what empirical evidence is there to support the implied claim that a distinct neurological state of non-belief exists in reality? How could an absence of belief be substantiated at all? Is that for me or is that for Matt? I'm not even sure I understood what they were asking. One more time? Yeah. Uh, can you see it on the... Oh, I guess you guys can't see it. Oh, I should change it so you can see the screen. Mm -hmm. If you're on YouTube, it, it appears up there. Since belief, beliefs are neurological states, what empirical evidence is there to support the implied claim that a distinct neurological state of non-belief exists in reality? How could an absence of a belief be substantiated at all? Okay. Um, how could an absence of belief be substantiated at all? Um, belief is the is the state of of being convinced of a proposition you can either be convinced of a proposition or not convinced uh zach is convinced of the proposition some god exists i am not convinced of that um i don't i don't understand this question about distinct neurological state of non-belief it is simply a fact i am not convinced of that just like um if i believe that uh if I, if I believe that when I let go of this bottle, it's going to fall down, I can't simultaneously believe that it's going to go up um, or, or else I'm being irrational. But 
I don't know that it matters if you can demonstrate a, non, a neurological state of non-belief. The fact is, I'm either convinced of something or I'm not. And uh, there are, I, I, would, I, I don't even understand how somebody could ask this question. Are you saying that you then believe everything? That, that there's nothing you don't believe? I think maybe um, the question is saying that a neurological state Maybe it's a mind. Uh, physicalism can't explain the existence of beliefs because beliefs are metaphysical things. Maybe that's what the question's getting at. How could an absence of belief be substantiated at all is the final question. The absence of belief is demonstrated to me by the fact that I don't believe it, um, but also people act in accordance with their beliefs. So um, if that, that would demonstrate that you're not convinced or something. But I, this is, I, I just I don't understand what the point is. Yeah, well, I think it, it, might be a, you don't. it might be a theory of mind question, like can, since a neurological state on atheism, or at least on some versions of atheism, is all that a non-belief is, then how can that be a non-belief rather than just an arrangement of neurons in a brain? Yeah. Okay, next one. Um, since belief informs action and a lack of impetus for action, by what objective and independently variable means can we then distinguish between non-beliefs and the existence of gods and belief in the non-existence of gods? Can you guys see them clearly now? Well, yeah, okay. it's hard to see there. So since beliefs inform actions, okay, and a lack of impetus for an action, what objective and independently verifiable means can we distinguish between non-belief in the existence of God and belief in the non-existence of God? Um, the fact that those are two separate propositions to say, I am not convinced X exists versus I am convinced X does not exist. This is entirely linguistic. It's the difference between I am not convinced you are guilty and I am convinced you are innocent. Um, I don't know the objective independently verifiable means you don't need any. This is by definition, there is a difference between X exists and you either believe it or you are not, you do not convinced, you're convinced of it or you're not convinced of it. And then X does not exist and you are either convinced of that proposition or not. This is just the way that propositions work. I, I don't have anything else for that. Cool. Um, next one from Grays174. How not subjectively defined is the word perfect? So how would you define perfect? Is that <laughs> how do you how do you give an objective well, definition for the word perfect? Onto it? I think the question is basically saying the word perfect, it seems to be being used subjectively. Is there a non-subjective definition for perfect? Uh, yeah, I was, I mean, yeah, go ahead. You go, you go Matt. No, you go. You go ahead. I, I, I would say that there are subjective uses or everything, including perfection, and I think some of them are hyperbolic, but you could come up with a an arbitrary definition for perfect, and it doesn't matter if it's subjective in origin, that's the one you're talking about. If I say uh, perfect means um, pizza is tasty, then Zach and I can sit here and have a, a conversation. It'll be really confusing because perfect has other uses as well, but we could subjectively define perfect as pizza is tasty, and and I would say, do you agree perfect? And Zach would say yes, unless he doesn't like pizza. I, 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 don't, I don't see what the necessity is behind how not subjectively defined a word is. Um, I think, I, I, I would hope that maybe this is getting to the fact that Zach has a perception of perfect and I have a perception of perfect uh, and they may not line up and that's an issue. But Zach's idea of perfect and my idea of perfect don't have to line up for us to talk about what each of them are. Just like we don't even have to speak the same language. Once we have some sort of language that where we can discuss the concept, that's all it is. Everything else is words getting in the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I would add is like I don't think I have a perfect grasp of what it means to be perfect. Um, but I would say that like perfection is like a fundamental like feature of the world, um, and that you, that's kind of like my brute thing. Like, what's my brute thing? Well, I would say it's something that's perfect. We could have a sense. We could say like, sure, like. Some things are like good, like honesty and truth and goodness, things like that. Um, and that gives us a sense of like what this like foundation of like perfection would be. But like, I can't fully understand like what perfect is. Like I'm limited in my perception of things. Another one, which will probably be hard to decipher. 
How is non-belief in God? Ah, oh, so this. How is then the statement non-belief in God's does not imply belief in the non-existence of God's? Not an appeal to the excluded middle, as belief in the existence of God's and belief in the non-existence of God's do represent a proposition negation. Yeah, I've already explained this several times, but I'll try it again because this individual seems to be very confused and is asserting that I said that it was all linguistic. When I talk about something being definitional, uh, I'm talking about how I use the terms. But the proposition, propositional logic, begins with a proposition, X exists. Uh, it doesn't have to be exist, but let's say, just to say this proposition, X exists. You can either be convinced of that proposition or not convinced of that proposition. But not being convinced that X exists does not mean that you are convinced that X does not exist. This is not a violation of the excluded middle. Here's the best example, maybe outside of not guilty innocent. There is some number of blades of grass on the planet. That number is either even or it's odd. If someone makes the proposition, the number of blades of grass on the planet is even, and I say, I do not believe that, that does not mean that I am claiming that it is odd. It means I am not convinced of that proposition. I hope that that clears it up because this was really, oh, this is, okay, this has just got to be a troll because now he's saying in chat, that is also a claim, Matt. No, this is how, this is how, this is how logic works. Here's a proposition. You either accept it or you don't. If I say I'm not convinced that the number of blades of glass is even, that does not mean I am convinced that it's odd. And I'm sorry if that's too difficult for you, but you can donate another $20 and I'll tell it to you again. Yeah, I think I generally just agree with Matt. So I almost have. Uh, question for Zach from Free Naturalist. What evidence leads us towards the idea that the universe required a mind? Yeah, so I would just go back to my opening statement where I'd say there's different things. Um, a mind, I think it's going to be hard to predict. Like if you say like fundamentally there's just a mind, it'd be hard to think like what, what would it create? Like something good, evil, like whatever. Um, but I'm going to go back again to my opening where I said there's certain things like the existence of like moral agents. Um, I'm sure everyone's sick of hearing that by now. Um, and like moral knowledge, a, a beautiful world, um, widespread theistic belief, cosmic fine tuning. Um, these are all things that are like evidential chips that push us towards the idea that there's a perfect mind that creates the universe. Question from Jacob B. What's the argument there's not an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-perfect being which has the intention to deceive you, can and does perfectly such that nothing can be known? How did you rule that out? Because that's for me asking how I can know there's not an all-good, all-perfect being that just wants to deceive me and make sure that I don't know anything right. Um, so I would say, like again, if we compare that theory with like my theistic theory, um, or like my perfect theism theory, I would say that like deceit is, it seems like it's wrong. Um, so a perfect being wouldn't want to deceive. So that's kind of the general gist of how I kind of like go against that argument. Do you want to comment, Matt? I, I'm not sure because um, I don't know that there, that there is any way to rule this out. Just like, I don't know that there's any way to rule out hard solipsism. It's, it's like a version of the new evil demon. How do you, you know, how do you know that, you, the reality you experience isn't being fed to you by an entity that is intentionally trying to deceive you. I don't. Um, but until such time as I have good reason to think that's a, the case, I have to operate in, with the reality that I experience, uh, which is an unfortunate thing because there are people whose grasp on reality, at least from our perceptive perception, is incredibly flawed, and we institutionalize some of them. But they're they're not to blame. Uh, they have to interact with the reality they experience. The, the, the brain is a is a confusing thing. And and the fact that that a proposition is either true or false is independent from what you believe about that proposition. Uh, you can a proposition could be true or false, and what you believe about it could be completely independent. Should be, actually. Another one from Matt's favorite questioner. Given that dosastic and voluntarism is the prevailing view, what empirical evidence is there to support being able to willfully withhold belief even if it is agreed that this is an ought and it's the only justifiable option um i'm going to voluntarily believe 
right now, as best I can, um, that you're not serious. <laughs> and uh, I won't be answering any more of this crap. All right, fair enough. Um... Actually, I don't believe that. But I don't think that, see, here's the thing. Uh, I don't think that belief is subject to the will. I think you either believe something or you don't. You are either convinced or you're not. Or you're not. And this isn't a, a decision or choice. So this question about doxastic involuntarism, what empirical evidence is there to support being able to willfully withhold belief? Um, I'm, I'm not sure that one can willfully withhold belief. I don't think that belief is a result, uh, is subject to will. Uh, I was just joking about, I'm going to voluntarily believe you're not serious, because you probably are. But what I believe isn't something I choose. This question isn't worded very seriously, but we could assume it's asking <laughs> about divine hiddenness. <laughs> Why are there so many <coughs> sincere atheists that analyze the arguments but remain unconvinced? Well, I would first I would say like I do think there are convincing arguments. That's why I'm a theist. Um, but then like looking at divine hiddenness, I would say that there's certain goods um, that come from divine hiddenness um, that would make sense of like divine hiddenness. Like thinking about things like people seeking God is good or people coming together with each other is a good thing. Um, and there's questions like, is God's goal for us to have epistemic certainty? Um, surely not, or you probably wouldn't have this debate. Or maybe it's something else, like for us to come to love God and know God more fully. Maybe hiddenness can contribute to that good. Um, God could come to be appreciated more. Maybe we could participate in God's work. I think there's a lot of plausible um, responses that you could give to divine hiddenness. So I don't think epistemic certainty is God's goal. So, And, and I don't know why. Um, it, it's one of those things where people are like, oh, th this is a, a belief that's really confidently informed by God. But if there was a God, what would we actually expect to see in the world? If there are people who think that what I believe about God is going to determine what sort of afterlife I get when there's no evidence really to think that there's an afterlife in the first place, let alone that we know what it is that qualifies or anything else. But if there was a morally good God, um, then that morally good God should provide convincing arguments, compelling evidence, should show what it expects of you. So right now, um, under Zach's model, where it makes no difference whether or not I reach a conclusion about the origin of the universe, that God is useless. The God Zach's proposing and defending is an absolutely useless God. It can't want anything or need anything. It can't I can't be sitting here subject to its judgment or whatever else because all of those things mean there would be consequences and a need for me to decide whether or not I have a belief about the origin of the universe. Yeah, the Harry Krishna theology has a bit easier because you've got multiple lifetimes, so your consequences for being wrong in this lifetime are quite low. Therefore, you can get away. <laughs> it's easier to fly an explanation of there's benefits to you going through the emotions and experience you're going through now and later on you can... Um, come to greater knowledge and understanding. Um, I think this is the last question. Will Zach and Matt have future debates? Oh, I have no idea. I can't predict the future. <laughs> I'm not opposed to it. And maybe we could do one on divine hiddenness because that seems to be kind of an underlying theme of what's running through my head and dancing around there. But uh, Yeah, it'd be fun. I'd love that. And yeah, maybe. Sounds I don't good. know. Okay, cool. So we can wrap it up there. Do you guys want to give some closing statements? Sure, I guess I'll go first. Um, I don't have too much that I would say with regards to a closing. I would just say that, like, again, like, I define God as a perfect mind that created the universe. Um, I think that there's good reason to believe in God because I think theism is simpler than atheism as it makes less foundational com commitments. And I think theism has a more explanatory power than atheism because the world looks more like what we'd expect if God exists than if God doesn't exist. And that's kind of where my chips are. I'd take a broadly Bayesian form where we're, like, comparing theories about the world about fundamental questions so like looking at the fundamental question like what is fundamental if anything and i'm going to say here's my theory that there's a perfect mind that created the universe and i think it's just the best explanation of the data we observe so that's why i'm a theist and i believe that god exists and i i, I don't know i don't know that i should get the last word i don't know that it's necessarily fair since he had to go first but um i didn't hear anything that demonstrates that a perfect mind is possible or how we can identify a perfect mind or detect a perfect mind or detect a product of a perfect mind or that the universe is the product of a perfect mind. What I heard was, hey, I think these things are more likely on theism. And that to me is not 
not faulting Zach for this because he's not the only one that said this. It's wholly unimpressive because if you propose a hypothesis to explain facts, um, it would be, be more miraculous if it didn't serve to be consistent with those facts. But for me, the only thing that is required to explain um, or to provide some sort of explanation for why we have agents and knowledge in a beautiful world and all this other stuff is that, is, or sorry, moral agents, is that we have agents who interact. And as soon as you have two people who have to share space, that brings into it how are they going to act with respect to each other, which encompasses all of morality. Um, and when those are flawed minds, imperfect minds, the notion that they would come up with perfect theistic hypothe or hypotheses about a perfect theistic being uh, and notions like fine-tuning and meaning and purpose, um, when there isn't evidence for that, uh, that's wholly unsurprising as well. We're flawed creatures reaching flawed conclusions, sending in flawed questions. Cool, thanks for that. There's one last question, but but maybe I can have... Oh, wait, hang on, I've had it. Maybe I can have Zach on separately to, and we can discuss that in depth. Why does God punish finite actions infinitely? Ooh, did, Jack, did Zach say he sought that? This is this is an interesting thing. I oh, I'm, not, I'm not sure what this, Zach's but, theological but like, views are. He, Christ, many Christians. People, yeah, I don't know what Zach's theological... I didn't even know he was a Christian until he showed up today. Um, and yet people <laughs> just make assumptions that Zach believes this or whatever. So mm -hmm. uh, do you believe that? And I mean, why? that's exactly what I was going to say is you assume that I believe in like eternal conscious torment, which... I definitely, well, I don't definitely, like, I lean towards rejecting. Like I think some sort of like form of, of annihilationism is probably true. Um, so, I mean, I would just reject, like I would say that it's not necessarily the case. So it's a good question, Cameron. And I appreciate it. And maybe you should have someone that's like super sold on like an EC2 version of like hell and ask them because I'm not totally sold on it because I think that's a really good question. And why I think there are some answers. I don't know if they're good answers. So I tend to agree with you probably. A good question well i could i could drill against annihilationism but let's do that in a separate podcast <laughs> yeah <laughs> not the time now um cool so thanks for that i'll i'll do the outro so, so thanks for having you guys on and maybe we'll do that debate on divine headedness in the future um if you like this sort of stuff be sure to subscribe and i'll catch you on the next one Hare krishna mm -hmm.